Greetings, Guardians. My name is Bife here. So, I don't always say this enough, but I think that it's worth making something clear. A lot of the time, the lore I talk about requires interpretation. Shocking, I know. But the reason I remind you all of that is because sometimes those interpretations that I give you are wrong. Lord knows I'm only human and my interpretations are sometimes just guesses based on the best knowledge that I have at my disposal. And you know what? Those interpretations are not always going to be right. I mean, literally, I remember back in Lightfall, prior to Root of Nightmares, I did an entire video about deterministic chaos, and I stated that some of the Taken might actually be under the control of Nezarek as opposed to the Witness. And why? Because we had some realistic ideas that Nezarek's philosophy might be opposed to the Witness from before. Now, as it stands, there's actually lore that explains why there was that discrepancy in the first place. We get it later down the line from the Unknown Disciple, who explains why all of these different ideas and philosophies were united within the Witness's pantheon of what the final shape might be. But ultimately, it doesn't change the fact that I was wrong, and that is just an interpretation. I say all of this with the knowledge that today's video on Tessellation, the new exotic that you get for pre-ordering certain editions of the final shape, contains a whole lot of guesswork and interpretation. And that is not guaranteed to be correct either. My interpretation is that all this is about the Witness, its people, and the fate of the universe if the Witness is to succeed. Am I correct? Maybe. Maybe not. For now though, just bear with me while I discuss this, and we'll see what's going on. And maybe you can give me your own interpretation as time unfolds and as we explore this together. But first, a word from our sponsors at Gamer Advantage. Gamer Advantage frames are stylish glasses that have blue light filter technology. They help to reduce the amount of eye strain you experience while gaming. And that alone is enough reason to buy them. You know, that's going to improve your focus. It stops you from getting headaches and keeps you at your best for longer. The real clincher for me, though, is that they can be paired with your own glasses prescription. So if you're like me and you use glasses on the day-to-day, -day, you can actually get a pair of frames that will not only be better for you while you're gaming, but also will help you see properly. So if you want to go ahead and grab some of these frames, you can use my discount link below, or use discount code BYF, that's just B-Y-F, to get 10% off your purchase. Also, check out these stylish new metal frames, the sleigh frames they've got. Bunch of new options are on sale, go ahead and check them out, and thank you to Gamer Advantage for sponsoring this video. Anyway, back to the lore. So, Tessellation is the exotic that you get for your pre-order of certain versions of the final shape. This powerful exotic fusion rifle is absolutely one of the weirdest aesthetics that we've seen in-game in a long time, and I'd go as far as to say it makes no sense. There are a ton of disparate design ideas that all seem like they've been mashed together, and that, well, that says a few things, but I'll get onto that in a moment. The top of the weapon feels very Witness and Pyramid inspired. It almost reminds me of a mixture of your more traditional Pyramid aesthetic combined with the shattered glass from Lightfall's trailers. And you know, that in itself is cool. It's pretty flat and angled as you'd expect from anything darkness related, but underneath, I mean, it's, it, there's no polite way to, to, to yeah, it's got teeth or claws. I, I, I don't know. The reason all of that matters is because when you look at a weapon's visual design, it's meant to tell you things about it. For example, if you look at Osteostriga, you can see that it's similar to Thorn, and from that you can gather that this is probably something that's made from the same ideas and philosophies as the original Weapons of Sorrow. And as it turns out, yeah, that's the lore. You look at Lumina, and it has an aesthetic that somewhat mimics a tree of silver wings, and that tells you that it's probably a weapon that's heavily aligned with the light. You look at Wishender, and it's got subtle nods to the Awoken iconography, implying that it was likely wielded by a famous Awoken bow master. In this instance, that's completely correct. It was wielded by Sir Ido. I look at Tessellation, and I see something that looks complete, yet very broken like something that's wrong. Maybe a mesh of stuff to do with both Nezarek and The Witness, and maybe there's some Hive influence in there, but it's, it's all a mess right here. My best guess as to why that is, is that maybe Tessellation is a reflection of the state of the inside of the Traveler's Pale Heart right now. Tessellation can take on any damage element by attuning to your grenade ability. 
This means that it can attune to all five different elements within Destiny at current, and with the Witness currently inside the Traveler, all those different energies of both the light and dark are present, so maybe there's something we can tell about that. The appearance itself again is a weird mix of something both living and dead. It's like someone's married a almost hive-like aesthetic with a more typical Pyramid Fleet one. I don't profess to know if that's the intention or not, but the appearance of part of the weapon as having organic bits and the rest of it looking more conventionally witness-themed, it's got to mean something. It looks like something that is not correct. Looks both living and dead. And no matter what, it looks kind of vicious. There might be more to it than first meets the eye, though, and this is where the lore entry for the weapon really takes us. That lore entry reads as follows. The monolith is hewn, the monument is built. Once, nothing became something. There was a game of possibilities. Patterns emerged that could, would, flourish or fail, wax or wane. And in the gaps between, there was nothing. But nothing is an absence defined by all the things that might one day be and yet never find fruition. It is an entropy of existence, for nothing to become something is as simple as a flipped bit, a chance mutation, a fallen leaf. Once it has become, it has always become, for castles are less fragile when built by something than nothing. Something grows and grown. It is seen. Once, something became something else. There were a people of potential and promise, of galvanizing growth. By their tools, their grand intention, the happenstance alignment of infinite years and atoms were as sculptor's clay, that which became the finest statuary. Purpose carved from meaninglessness, the chance generation of the universe crafted into beauty, intentionality. That which served no reason ceased, randomness elided by the sculptor's art. Something changes, and changed, it continues. Once, something will become nothing. There are beings who plant their intentions and say, so far, no further. The bulwarks and the bastions, the stubborn flower that will defy even stone. In these hands, possibility is a single-minded tool. Resolution, pursuit, obliteration. What potential lies in empty space? All that dies is only ever transformed, absized and swallowed by wilderness returned to infinite metamorphosis, to excise from that rich loam of transformation requires no less than perfect certainty. Here is the secret. A plowshare and a sword have never truly differed. So, let's try and break this down with the acknowledgement that whatever I'm about to say may well be a lot of barking up the wrong tree. The first thing that we hear seems to point to the idea that the weapon is absolutely related to the Witness's activities inside the Pale Heart of the Traveler. The monolith is the Witness's fortress within the Pale Heart, and we've seen it in the trailers and Vidox, and it's been mentioned a whole bunch. With the idea that the Witness is at the heart of this, I think we can start to break down the whole lore tab as a sort of story of the universe that is centered on the Witness and its people. If you look at the beginning, you can see the language that starts to mimic the only thing that we have that's even vaguely close to a true creation story in Destiny, the unveiling lore book, and the metaphor of the gardener and the winnower in the garden before time. Now, it was noted by one of the Bungie narrative team employees that this book is relatively untrustworthy, and yeah, even from the beginning of the book, I'd argue that that's actually pretty clear from the outset. The whole story is one from someone's perspective, an interpretation of something that happened, phrased as a beginning to the universe and the start of a tale meant to aggrandize the witness, or at very least, its perspective. 
It should always have been clear to us that this was going to be a rather suspect lore entry. I think years ago I cautioned about this when I first covered it, but nonetheless, this is an important point, because the language here in Tessellation mimics that early reverence that was had for the time before time, the time that simply must have existed, a time when there was a gardener and a winnower in a garden before possibility. Perhaps then the Tessellation Law tab is hinting at these very moments. The last line of the Law tab is also worth picking up on in this regard, because it also seems to aggrandize the purpose and philosophy of the witness. The line hints to the idea that creation is actually destruction and vice versa in a manner of speaking, thus pushing us to the idea that the destruction we're about to see is actually a great act of creation. The choice of words here with swords and plowshares is also a very specific verse that comes from Judeo-Christian religious texts. In the Bible, this can be found in the book of Isaiah. The passage in question is an Old Testament verse that recommends following the path of God by not learning the lessons of war and by literally turning implements of war, such as swords and spears, into tools for farming, aka plowshares and pruning hooks. This idea of the contrast between peace and war and the invocation of this specific contrasting pair of instruments, the sword and the plowshare, is being done with a purpose. The writer of this passage knew what they were doing when they picked that out of literature. They are trying to imply that destruction and creation are part of the same process. This is also echoed in the last of the large paragraphs where the law reading says, all that dies is only ever transformed. Speaking of those big paragraphs, I think we can split them down into three distinct eras according to what the story is trying to tell. We have the era before the Witness's people and what led to the creation of some of their lives. We have the Witness and its people generally as they tried to find their purpose and their function. And lastly, we have the Witness and its movement towards ending this universe and creating something new under its vision of the final shape. Examining that assertion closer, we can first look at the opening of the large beginning paragraph, which is one preceded with the words, once nothing became something. This is immediately followed in the main paragraph by what I think is the most direct reference to the unveiling law book that I mentioned earlier. It mentions, or at very least, seems to have language that hints at the flower game, which was supposedly the way of order prior to the first conflict between the winnower and the traveler. The flower game story also references how the gardener, which is seen as analogous to the light, was attempting to alter the pattern by allowing things to exist that shouldn't, thus changing the pattern that was supposedly perfect into something that was not. This may be a hint to the idea that Creating something from nothing is as simple as flipping a bit. This fits in so neatly with the unveiling story that it's suddenly hard to imagine that this isn't from the witness's perspective. But again, we don't know any of that for certain, and it's entirely possible I'm barking up the wrong tree here. The second large paragraph is preceded by the words, Once something became something else. The paragraph that follows seems to clearly talk about the precursors to the witness and how they had a vision for the universe and how it should be. The line, purpose carved from meaninglessness, the chance generation of the universe crafted into beautiful intentionality, is a particularly telling one. Remember that according to Asa, what the precursors to the witness lacked was not technology or bounty, it was purpose. They found it in the idea that they could use the light and dark in unison to reshape the universe to be better. This final shape is the basis of that philosophy, and purpose carved from meaninglessness really seems to hint at that. The final large paragraph is preceded by the sentence, once something will become nothing. This paragraph seems to reject the idea that things should be created to last with obstinance. The ending of the paragraph in particular seems to push the idea that creation is best undertaken by a careful hand that can curate all of that which is into things that will be and things that will not be. In other words, this is essentially trying to espouse the very idea that the witness is trying to enforce. 
This is what the final shape would be. A universe that is supposedly perfect. A universe under the witness's control. If that's all correct, and this is actually hitting on what the main points of the writer's intentions were, then Tessellation isn't just a weapon, it's a mission statement, and a personal record of history. It speaks of the past and the future in terms of ideas. The failures of the past and the imperfections it created did eventually lead to something righteous, something that would bring about a better future. What all of this fails to mention, as is pretty standard for anything involving The Witness, is that the whole thing requires all the universe to be remade. Not scoured of life, not wiped clean, it requires the universe to be undone entirely. It requires a ceasing of reality. This is the ultimate price that The Witness is willing to pay. A perfect universe to it is worth a total sacrifice of an imperfect one. Complete destruction without any exception. Thus, the final line, which acts as the ultimate justification for such total annihilation, is appropriately based in both the ideas of creation and destruction. The idea that annihilation is ultimately an act of creation, and that creation came about, and would always lead us here, is something that is appropriately reflected too. For things to be better, they must be unmade. The plowshare and the sword have always been similar. As the hive might say, Ayat. As we might hopefully say, Yeah, but that's just your opinion. Regardless of whatever we might think, what the witness thinks, and what ultimately might be true, the certainty of the witness's mission has never been more openly expressed, at least in my opinion, and the urgency with which we should respond has never been more clearly stated. If all these interpretations are correct, that is. But maybe they are, maybe they aren't. We'll have to wait and see as we get closer to the final shape and more clues about tessellation reveal themselves. I want to ask this of you, though. Why do you reckon it is that tessellation changes elements? Yeah, sure, there's a bounded thing that's all tied up in the actual word tessellation there, but why do you reckon it is that it can pull from all the different paracausal energies that we have around the Witness and the Pale Heart and the Guardians? What do you reckon that's about? Let me know down in the comments below. It's the one thing that I wasn't ever truly sure about. If you want more Destiny content, go ahead and hit subscribe and the bell next to subscribe to turn on those email notifications. And also, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like. But note that as per usual, your viewership as always is quite enough for me. And that in the meantime, my name has been, my name is Bife. Parodasia Arastra. I'll see you, Starside.